Thank you, Cynthia. Good afternoon. Uh, it is my pleasure to collaborate with Oculus. This is my, my financial disclosure. This is my colleagues that I am very glad to collaborate with. So when we talk about the quest to enhance ectasia diagnosis, it's very important that we have to go further. We have to go beyond, but not over. We have to go beyond topography. We have to go beyond understanding of uh, the diagnosis of mild keratoconus. We have to understand that we have to understand susceptibility for ectasia to develop so that we can get uh, understanding for how to help these patients. And biomechanical properties are fundamental. I was fortunate to train with Steve Wilson, who is one of the lead experts on wound healing. And the second biological tissue property it would be uh, biomechanics. And we have Cynthia Roberts and BJ Dupes working very much on that since a long time ago. The dynamic shine fluke imaging takes uh, a very nice characterization of the cornea deformation with uh, 140 frames in 30 milliseconds. And this generates a lot of data. And it's very important that we understand how to analyze this data. And the beautiful work that Paolo and Ricardo did that lead to the Troutman Award last year from the ISRS and the CBI, we can integrate all this data using linear regression analysis. We have done a lot of work to understand this before LASIK to screen patients at risk for refractive surgery. And the integration that we have with the Pentacam, with tomography and biomechanics, is what we are trying to present for you today. And we have the Ambrosio, Roberts, and Vinci Guerra display that integrates all that, that comes with the TBI and the PRFI, along with many other metrics. So how we do that? We have objective parameters. We need those because if you look at the experts, when they try to interpret those topography maps, they vary. They vary with themselves if you change the scales. So this is very important that you have objective parameters. Objective from topography, from front surface, from tomography, 3D, elevation front and back and thickness, and also from biomechanics. He kind of did a great job on describing the core vis metrics. We have the stiffness parameter, which is very obvious that if you ident the cornea more, you have a softer cornea. But you have to understand pressure. Pressure is definitely one of the most important things that we have to characterize with the core vis, which is, by the way, the best tonometer we have on the market. We also need to have populations, how you set up the disease. And I come with this integration uh, you have to talk about how you tell it's better. It's better than topography, but topography is great to see topography abnormalities in a patient with 20-20 best correct vision, but the fellow eye of this patient just demonstrates you have to go beyond, definitely not over, but beyond. And we included in objectively classifying those cases with normal topography, keys are less than 60, IS then less than 1.4, central case less than 47, and no TKC detection of keratoconus. And those cases will be very important for us to enhance our ability to detect ectasia before the problem occurs on the, on the surface. We also have to look at accuracy, ROC curves, and we have to integrate with artificial intelligence. This has been one of the most important work done by Bernardo Lopez, who is finishing his PhD uh, in a few months with all these theses. We did many ways of integrating the data, and the random forest with leave one out was the best one. So we have to correlate those data and compare with the metrics that we have, like the bad D. We created a bad DI so that we have a correlation easier to compare because it's going to be from zero to one. We have dot plots and we can compare those. The random forest is a very interesting metric uh, calculation that you can integrate data using uh, a very nice and fancy analysis. You have to be very careful for not having an over uh, estimation for getting a, a good validation. And the leave one out cross validation really validates the model so that we have tomography data, biomechanical data, and we get an outcome with the artificial intelligence. So here we have the bad D, you see the distribution, you have very good separation for the abnormal case. We have 204 in the original study for the keratoconus patients, and we have the 94 cases with very asymmetric ectasias, so that 72 we had the fellow eye with ectatic disease that was able to be uh, measured before any surgery. 
and you see the curves here, and the separations are much higher with the TBI. So the TBI comes with 100% sensitivity and specificity in this training uh, uh, system that was published in the JRS last year. And for the very asymmetric cases, we have 90% sensitivity with only 4% uh, false positives. So I do believe this is a surrogate of what we call a susceptibility from stability to the disease on the biomechanical metrics. So this is one of the most uh, uh, interesting papers I have ever worked with in my, in my career, and this is published in the JCRS as well. External validations are very important because we need to make sure that we are not over-treating these populations that we had for the training set. So we had the first study coming from Iran. It's uh, black and white. It's uh, keratoconus versus normals. And you see, even with the tomography, that you have a good separation, you see here much more separation. It makes us the understanding that even with the ROC curve that is almost perfect, virtually perfect to better say, we have a better separation with the TBI. Uh, this, this month, we have the announcement of the first colon award from the International Journal of Keratoconus and Ectatic Coronary Disease, which was awarded for my colleague, Jose Haddad, George Haddad, who did a beautiful work on his first impressions on the clinical settings along with George Waring and Caroline Rocha. This is also done at my clinic in external validation with patients that we saw after the, the, the TBI was conceived. And we see those cases are still here. So a lot of people come, you're still not getting all these cases. And you have some cases like that. Those are the cases that we want to detect because those cases may be the susceptible ones that you want to screen out from refractive surgery or even maybe considering a procedure that is less invasive that will cause less biomechanical impact. I'll come with a couple of concepts for you. The global consensus came that true unilateral keratoconus does not occur, but secondary ectasia can occur, and I would say can occur in any eye, and definitely can be unilateral. This is one of the best unilateral cases. This patient came as a unilateral uh, ectasia presentation. The fellow eye is 2015, and the fellow eye is being stable. The right eye did a carrot ring implantation, did very well. And those cases, they typically do well because the corners are not so soft. The patient was sent to follow up to Dan Reinstein, who is very prolific on his ability to do advanced diagnostic testing, including the Gatinel SAD score on the orb scan, Pentacam, Artemis. And Artemis, with the epithelial map, which we call segmental tomography, was normal at his algorithm. Also the same with a score analyzer and also with a pentacam. And we got one of these cases, one of the, the visits I got, the Corvus, and we were able to retrospectively integrate the TBI as a zero. The concept of ectasia susceptibility was introduced when I saw this patient for the first time. The patient had LASIK only in the left eye. She was not happy with the results. Nothing was done to the right eye. A few months after the LASIK procedure in the left eye, she developed ectasia. So nothing was done in the right eye. If you see the right eye, would qualify as a LASIK candidate based on front surface and thickness. We published in 2010, the bad D was on the yellow side, and the ORA, we had a little bump here, and the CRF was less than 8.8. .8. So we published, this is ectasia susceptibility. It's not a keratoconus. The phase is 2015 distance corrected. Green topography. This patient is still stable in the right eye. Ectasia is doing well with a contact lens. And we got an exam when she was out of the contact lens for at least six weeks. And the right eye, you see topography with the placido. You see the change you have on different scales. And also the similarity, this is the Ambrosio 2 scale on the curvature, very much similar on the shine fluke and on the placido. And this patient was analyzed on the TBI, and you see a very abnormal TBI. This is interesting that this patient is 2015 distance correct vision. So it's a good example of ectasia susceptibility. Also another very interesting case is these identical twins. The first twin came with a very asymmetric keratoconus, and you see topography from Scheinflug again being very similar from the topography from the, the Placido. And the TBI was abnormal in all of the settings. So this is a 4i with the same genetic information. 
and one eye had ectasia because she rubbed that eye too much, and all the three eyes with relatively normal topography, you have a TBI that's subnormal. A lot of people ask me, do you still need to do placido? I think it's very important that placido is still done because we screen for the most common complications of lazy vision correction, which is dry eye, and also all the information we can get to improve the treatment for those patients. When we talk about the integration of tomography and biomechanics, it's very important that we understand the need for being objective and the need to use this data in a proper way, and artificial intelligence is definitely the way to go. It's important to understand that diagnosis and screening is different. Also, staging, prognosing, seeing progression, and planning procedures will be different approaches for using the objective information that we have from imaging. Enhanced ectasia, we have to go beyond, but definitely not over. Unilateral ectasia can occur. I prefer to call those cases ectasia, not keratoconus. And eventually, before we have a screening with the genetic approach, we'll be able to understand what is more phenotype ectasia, what is a more genetic ectasia. And some of these cases, is they can present with bilateral disease or susceptibility, or what we call it as frust, which is probably not the best term for that. Ectasia susceptibility characterization is what we are trying to do, and definitely advanced topography is still necessary for ocular surface evaluation in this true revolution that we have in corneal imaging that is in a huge and fast evolution. Thank you very much.